Imagine, if you will, King's College, Cambridge, almost 100 years ago. Every Christmas Eve has its ritual. Those invited make their way for the appointed time. Out of the darkness, while the master waits. Montague Rhodes James provost of kings, scholar, antiquary, and writer of ghost stories. A Warning to the Curious by M. R. James Seaborough, on the east coast, a long seafront and a street, red cottages, church and distant Martello Tower to the south. I used to go there pretty regularly for golf in the spring. I would put up at the Bear with a friend called Henry Long and we used to take a sitting room and be very happy there. Since he died, I haven't cared to go there and I don't know that I should anyhow after the particular thing that happened on our last visit. It was in April 1902 we were there, and by some chance we were almost the only people in the hotel. The ordinary public rooms were practically empty, so we were all the more surprised when after dinner our private sitting room door opened and a young man put his head in. He was rather a rabbity, anemic specimen, light hair, light eyes, but not unpleasing. He made some pretense of reading a book. It became plain after a few minutes that this visitor of ours was in a state of nerves, so I put away my writing and turned to talk to him. After some remarks, he became rather confidential. You'll think it very hot of me, but the fact is that I've had something of a shock. Well, I recommended a drink of some cheering kind, and we had it and we settled down to hear what his difficulty was. It began, he said, more than a week ago when I bicycled over to Froston, only about five or six miles to see the church. I'm very much interested in architecture and it's got one of those porches with niches and shields. I took a photograph of it and then of some coats of arms. One showed three crowns and I'm not much of a herald I recognized it as the old arms of the kingdom of East Anglia I looked round and there was the rector coming up the path he saw where I'd been looking ah yes said the rector that's a very curious matter but I don't know whether a gentleman like yourself is interested in our old stories hmm? Oh, yes, I said. He told me, uh, the rector, that there had always been a belief in these parts in the three holy crowns. The old people say they were buried in different places near the coast to keep off the Danes or the French or the Germans. And they say that one of the three was dug up a long time ago and another disappeared. 
by the encroaching of the sea, and only one is still left doing its work, keeping off invaders. Do they say where it is? I asked. The rector said to me, Yes, indeed, they do, but uh, they don't tell. And his manner did not encourage me to put the obvious question. I have to tell you first about the Agers, he said. The Agers? I repeated. It's a very old name in these parts, the rector informed me. These Agers say or said that their branch of the family were the guardians of the last crown. A certain old Nathaniel Ager was the first one I knew, and he camped out at a place where the crown is said to be hidden. Young William did the same, and I've no doubt hastened his end, for he was consumptive from exposure and night watching. So the last of the Holy Crowns, if it is there, has no guardian now. That was what the rector told me, said Mr. Paxton to me, and you can fancy how interesting I found it. The only thing I, I could think of when I left him was how to hit upon the spot where the crown was supposed to be. Oh, I wish I'd left it alone. But there was a sort of fate in it. For as I bicycled past the churchyard, my eye caught a fairly new gravestone, and on it was the name of William Ager, aged 28. Paxton carried on. I asked the owner of the curiosity shop about William Ager, and of course he happened to remember that he lodged in a cottage in the North Field and, and died there. A woman I met said how sad it was, him dying so young, and she was sure it came from him spending the night outdoors in the cold weather. Then I had to say, did he go out on the sea at night? And, and she said, oh, no, 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 it was, it, was, it was on the hill over there with the trees on it. And there I was. I know something about digging in these barrows. I've opened many of them in the down country, but that was with, with the owner's leave and in broad daylight and with men to help. Still, the soil was very light and sandy and easy, and there was a rabbit hole or so that might be developed into a sort of tunnel. The going out and the coming back at odd hours to the hotel was going to be the awkward part. When I made up my mind about the way to excavate, I told the people that I was called away for a night and I spent it out there. Our friend carried on with his story. I made my tunnel. I won't bore you with the details of how I sported it and filled it in when I'd done. The main thing is... I got the crown. Well, naturally, uh, we, Long and I, we were both surprised and interested. No one has ever seen an Anglo-Saxon crown. At least, no one had. But our man gave us a mournful look. Yes, he said, and the worst of it is, I don't know how to put it back. Put it back, we cried out. Why, my dear sir, you've made one of the most exciting finds ever heard of in this country. But all he did was to put his face in his hands and mutter, I don't know how to put it back. At last, Long said, well, you'll forgive me, I hope, if I seem to be impertinent, but are you quite sure you have got it? He sat up and said, oh, yes, there's no doubt of that. I have it here in my room, locked in my bag. You can come and look at it if you like. I, I won't offer to bring it here. We weren't likely to let the chance slip. We went with him to his room. It was only a few doors off. The boots boy was just collecting shoes in the passage. Or so we thought. 
afterwards we weren't so sure. Our visitor, Mr. Paxton, was in a worse state of shivers than before. He hurried into the room and beckoned us after him, turned on the light and shut the door carefully, and then he unlocked his kit bag and produced a bundle of clean pocket handkerchiefs in which something was wrapped, laid it on the bed, and opened it up. It was silver, set with some gemstones. The workmanship was plain, almost rough. I can now say that I have seen an actual Anglo-Saxon crown. I was intensely interested, of course. I wanted to turn it over in my hands, but Paxton prevented me. Don't you touch it, he said. I'll do that. And with a sigh that was really dreadful to hear, he took it up and turned it about so that we could see every part of it. <sighs> Seen enough, he said at last, and we nodded. He wrapped it up and locked it in his bag and stood looking at us forlornly. What is to be done? was Paxton's opening. It's got to go back, and I daren't be there at night, and daytime's impossible. The truth is that I've never been alone since I touched it. Then it all came out. Paxton looked over his shoulder and beckoned to us to come nearer to him and began speaking in a low voice. He said, It began when I was first prospecting and put me off again and again. There was always somebody, a man, standing by one of the furs. He was never in front of me. I always saw him with the tail of my eye on the left or the right. And he was never there when I looked straight at him. I would lie down for quite a long time, take careful observations, and make sure there was no one. And then when I got up and began prospecting again, there he was. was making the tunnel, Paxton continued anxiously. It was worse. It was like someone scraping at my back all the time. I thought for a long time it was only soil dropping on me, but as I got nearer the, 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 the crown, it was unmistakable. And when I actually laid it bare and put my fingers into the ring of it and pulled it out, there came a sort of a cry behind me. Oh, I can't tell you how desolate and threatening it was. If I hadn't been the wretched fool that I am, I should have put the thing back and left it, but I didn't. The rest of the time was just awful. I had hours to get through before I could decently come back to the hotel. First, I spent time filling up my tunnel and covering my tracks, and all the while, he was there. Sometimes you see him, sometimes you don't, just as he pleases. He has some power over your eyes. I wasn't off the spot very long before sunrise, and then I had to get to the junction for Zebra and take a train back. There were always hedges or, or gorse bushes or park fences along the road, some sort of cover, I mean, and I was never easy for a second. And then when I began to meet people going to work, they always looked behind me very strangely. And the porter at the train was like that too. And the guard held open the door after I'd got into the carriage. 
just as he would if there was somebody else coming, you know. Oh, you may be very sure it isn't my fancy, <laughs> he said with a mirthless sort of laugh. And then he went on, and even if I do put it back, he won't. Forgive me, I can tell that. And I was so happy a fortnight ago. He dropped into a chair. And I believe he began to cry. We didn't know what to say, but we felt we must come to the rescue somehow, and so we said that if he was set on putting the crown back in its place, we would help him. And I must say that after what we had heard, it did seem the right thing. If all that Paxton said was true, might there not be something in the original idea of the crown having some, some curious power bound up with it? To guard the coast? It was nearly half past ten. There was a brilliant moon. We were off on this strange errand before we had time to think how very much out of the way it was. Paxton had a large coat over his arm, and under it was the wrapped-up crown. There was nobody about, nobody at all. We went up the road to the church and turned in at the churchyard gate. I confess to having thought that there was, or there might be, some lying there who might be conscious of our business. As we neared the mound up on the ridge, Henry Long felt, and I felt too, that there were what I can only call dim presences waiting for us, as well as a far more actual one accompanying us. As for Paxton's agitation, he breathed like a hunted beast, and we couldn't either of us look at his face. How he would manage when we got to the very place we hadn't thought about. It seemed so sure that that would not be difficult. Nor was it. I never saw anything like the dash with which he flung himself at a particular spot in the side of the mound and tore at it so that in a very few minutes the greater part of his body was out of sight. We stood holding the coat and that bundle of handkerchiefs and looking very fearfully, I must admit, about us. There was nothing to be seen. Paxton pulled himself out of the hole and stretched a hand back to us. Give it to me, he whispered, unwrapped. We pulled off the handkerchiefs and he took the crown. The moonlight just fell on it as he snatched it. We hadn't touched that bit of metal ourselves and I thought since that it was just as well. In another moment, Paxton was out of the hole again and busy shoveling back the soil. His hands were now bleeding. We were a couple of hundred yards from the hill when Long suddenly said to him, I say, you've, uh, you've left your coat there. That won't do. See? And I certainly did see a long, dark overcoat lying where the tunnel had been. Paxton hadn't stopped, however. He only shook his head and held up the coat on his arm. When we joined him, he said without any excitement, but as if nothing mattered any more, that wasn't my coat. And indeed, when we looked back again, 
that dark thing was not to be seen. Back in our room, we did our very best to make Paxton take a cheerful view. There's the crown safe back, we said. Very likely you would have done better not to touch it, and he agreed with that. But no real harm has been done, and we shall never give this away to anyone who would be so mad as to go near it. Paxton turned to thank him, yes. And we told him, no, 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 thanks weren't due, and we would meet again tomorrow. Next day dawned as beautiful an April morning as you could desire. Long and I went to the links and had lunch there rather early so as not to be late back. When we did get back, we found Paxton there, peaceably, reading. Ready to come out, said Long. Say, in, in half an hour's time? Oh, certainly, he said. I had my bath first and I went and lay down on my bed and slept for about ten minutes. Long and I came out of our rooms at the same time and went together to the sitting room. Paxton wasn't there, only his book. Nor was he in his room, nor in the downstairs rooms. We shouted for him. A servant girl came out and said, Why, I thought you gentlemen was gone out already. And so did the other gentleman. He heard you uh, calling from the path there and ran out in a hurry, and I looked out of the coffee room window, but I didn't see you. However, you run off uh, down the beach that way. Well, without a word, we ran that way too. It was the opposite direction to that of last night's expedition. We ran on as far as the top of the shingle bank and stopped. Long said he saw Paxton some distance ahead, running and waving his stick as if he wanted to signal to people who were on ahead of him. I couldn't be sure. One of these sea mists was coming up very quickly from the south. There was someone. That's all I could say and there were tracks on the sand, like someone running who wore shoes, and there were other tracks made before those, for the shoes sometimes trod in them and interfered with them of someone not in shoes. There they were, over and over again. And we had no doubt whatever that what we saw was the track track of a bare foot that showed more bones than flesh. The notion of Paxton running after, after anything like that and supposing it to be the friends he was looking for, we were terrified just thinking about it. How the thing he was following might stop suddenly and turn round on him and what sort of face it would show, half seen in the mist which all the while was getting thicker and thicker. And as I ran on, wondering how the poor wretch could have been lured into mistaking that other thing for us, I remembered him saying, he has some power over your eyes. It was weird eerie like some sorcery how the sun could still be high in the sky and yet we were seeing nothing when we got to the old battery just by the martello tower we clambered to the top as quick as we could to draw breath and look over the shingle in front if the mist would let us see anything we needed to rest for a moment we had run a mile at least nothing whatever was visible ahead of us on that long shingle spit and we were just turning to get down and run on with no more hope it was then that we heard 
what I can only call a laugh. It came from below and swerved away into the mist. That was enough. We bent over the wall. Paxton was there at the bottom. You don't need to be told that he was dead. His tracks showed that he'd run along the side of the battery, had turned sharp round the corner of it, and then he must have dashed straight into the open arms of someone who was waiting there. His mouth was full of sand and stones, and his teeth and jaw were broken to bits. I only glanced once at his face. What were we to say at the inquest? It was a duty we felt not to give up the secret of the crown there and then, to have it published in every paper. I don't know how much you would have told, but what we did agree upon was this, to say that we'd only made acquaintance with Paxton the day before, and that he had told us he was under some apprehension of danger at the hands of a man called William Hager. Also that we had seen some other tracks besides Paxton's when we followed him along the beach. But of course by that time everything was gone from the sands. It was just as well that no one had any knowledge of any William Ager living in the district. The evidence of the man, a caretaker at the Martello Tower who saw Paxton fall, freed us from all suspicion. All that could be done was to return a verdict of willful murder by person or persons unknown. Nothing more could be discovered about Paxton, and so the legal business reached, so to speak, a dead end. And I've never been at Zebra, or even near it, since. <laughs>